My name is Benjamin Munro, but I'm Benny. I'm 50 years old. I'm a barrister. I have a beautiful partner, Robbie, and I have three sons. I'm here on the Tarkine Coast. And this is my 50th birthday to myself, my present. I turned 50 earlier this month. So I think it's a great chance to spend the next nine days to maybe do something I've not I've not spent enough of my 50 years doing. And that's to that's to take the time to find out who I am. What would motivate a man to leave the comforts of home and go out into a wild place for a period of aloneness and really for, for longer than I've ever been alone. The answer for that, I think for me is life as I was leading it had really started to lack value and it's really for me it's been a, a yearning for meaning. 50 is only a number and I know it's only chronological but as I have drifted towards 50 that question is it started as a a whisper and it's it's grown and grown into a longing I've wanted to know what I'm doing here what is my purpose and the harder I worked and the more billable hours I did as a barrister and I guess the more money I made, the, the less any of that made sense. I knew it was, that wasn't the answer. Material things and status and money have basically left me empty. So I figured the answer might be out there. And I also recognised that you know, maybe comfort was the enemy. Comfort is, it dulls the senses, I think. It numbs. And I've certainly got a habit of doing that, of, of just numbing out and, and being so depleted in, in energy that there's, no, there's nothing left to ask questions. And in, an, in a way, I just felt my life source ebbing away. I know that sounds dramatic, but that's the best language I can use to explain it. That was like that, that movie Groundhog Day. Every day just is beige. It just seems to be like the next day. It's just a, an endless grind of mediocrity. Yesterday, as the ferry pulled away, I had a real sense of change and transformation, a journey. The ferry was a journey up the river that brought us here. And, and here is amazing. It's wild and open. And I think that's encouraged, I know that's encouraged some things for me. I'm not sure that my heart's always wild and open because I'm too much in the head. Always in the head. My role as a lawyer, I'm paid to be in the head. And I'm not sure that's the best way to do the job. This morning we did some Qigong and I found my body again. It was awesome to be in the body, to let the head have a rest and to really feel the earth beneath my feet and I love the ocean and we were in front of the ocean and, and just the roar and the power of the ocean seemed to just, in the end I wasn't sure whether that power was inside or outside of me. It was amazing. And the invitation that Darvis gave was, was just to let go, just to feel that energy and to play with it. 
and I think that really set me on a course today towards transformation. I found myself yearning for answers, so that's why I went into the wild. What was my greatest fear in coming out here? There's no doubt there was fear. Um, and on a number of levels. And I think the first one was just, I've never done anything like this before in terms of going into wild place. And I think my, one of my greatest fears was around this idea of incompetence in dealing with the, the natural world, the, the ability to meet challenge, meet challenge of environment. Um, so I very much had preconceptions about myself that are really old, I discovered. You know, ben, Benny's not great with his hands. You know, that's why he's a lawyer. Benny's not great with direction. Benny gets lost. This is uh, day one of my solo. And in a sense, I kind of got lost trying to get to the site that Darv and I had talked about. And I'm not even really sure I'm at the right site. But I don't care because this place I've found, I just know this one's for me. I came in and over that hill behind me, a sea eagle just swooped in and came in and landed on the rock up there. And then I was walking out before and there was a wallaby there and I just thought it would jump away, but it didn't. It just sat there, curious. I looked at it, it looked at me. I think we're gonna be friends. This feels like a friendly place. I'm looking out to sea and it's wild and untamed and beautiful. It's kind of how I feel right now. One of my fears was that external environment would would end me, would overcome me, that I would become horrendously lost or, or I'd suffer from exposure or I'd, I'd, I'd lose the very thing I needed to retain in order to survive, I suppose. All of which sounds a bit dramatic saying it now, but that's, this is what arises as, as I set off. But the truth is it wasn't the external environment that represented my greatest fear. It was, in fact, what was inside. And I recognised that I think my greatest fear was being alone with myself. Day two, the most amazing day. This afternoon I, I went down to the coast and I sat on a high point for so long. I can't remember the last time I just sat. Nowhere to be, nothing to do. And I really didn't think. Which was... so good. As I was looking out, I, I swore I saw a seal. I thought I saw a seal. I looked and I looked at some binoculars and I I scoured the ocean and I couldn't find the seal again. Until I was coming down and I got down to the bottom of the rock formation I was on. And just off to the left, something caught my eye and it was a skeleton, a seal skeleton. And it was all dismembered. It, its skull was in one place and then a section of its spine in another, its ribs and its thorax just off to the side. And yet somehow all of its pieces were lying in the one area. It hadn't been dispersed, at least not yet. 
it really, it was quite beautiful. But it rung a bell inside me. Death is coming. With every breath, every day. And I don't say that in a morbid way, I say that in a way that energises me. It's time to live. I didn't know what the silence was going to bring. I just had this feeling that there's probably something, there is something I've been running from for as long as I can remember. And it's so deep and so dark that I haven't even given it a name. And I recognise that's that drives the work, that drives the billable hours, it drives the accumulation of material things. It's all a distraction. I know it's all been a distraction and I knew I'd been distracting myself from something. And as I walked away from Davos, I mean, that's what was consuming me. I didn't know what lay in the shadows. And it's not the shadows under the trees or under the rocks. It was, it's in the shadows of me. That's the scariest thing, I think, that a journey like this demands that you deal with. But willingness is the thing. I weigh things up. Do I want a life without meaning? Or do I want to finally turn around and confront what I've been running from? And I discovered there's no better place to do that than than wild place. So what what did I discover out there? That's a hard question to answer succinctly. What I discovered out there is is what I've been running from. <laughs> and and I finally turned around and I and I faced it. And I I have a, a story. It's a story as old as I am that um, that somehow I did something wrong at some point so so long ago that it just seems like a dream. It's an image more than a distinct memory. And and that's bound up in in the moment that my personality, I suppose, crystallised as a really small child, an infant. And what happened when I got into space and spaciousness is as I'm surrounded by the elements, wind and rain and waves crashing into rocks, nature, sea eagles soaring overhead, but just the space, the vast space and the vast silence. What I hadn't been willing to listen to, it first came as a bit of a whisper, but really by day two or three of my solo, it was a roar. It's as if it just shook out of me. And it, it asked me questions. What is this worthlessness I feel? What is this self-hatred that arises? What is this lack of confidence? What is this, ultimately it was, what is this rage? You might be able to hear the surf crashing on the rocks today, out there at the minute. And today, uh, something came to me and I, I just, I just felt uh, as I watched those waves crashing that there was something I needed to deal with and it's been pretty cathartic. I'm glad I got it out. So I wrote a piece. I'll just read it. Anger. When I watch these waves furiously hurl themselves against the rock, I feel my anger. I want to be one of those waves. I want to build with all my might and all my power. 
and I want to hurl all of that against my enemy. This anger is very old. I see it was born in an infant child. This rage was ignited in a child who didn't understand its power, who could not understand the damage it could do, who loved and wanted love, one who wanted care, one who received none of that, one who was left alone. I don't have a specific memory, more like a shadow or a, a dream. But I know my rage started then, a frantic sort of rage. It didn't help me. I believe it drove me away from those who were charged with my care. I believe they abandoned me because of that rage. So I buried it very deep. And yet here it is, not gone, not transmuted, seething, boiling. It terrifies me because if I let it free, I will destroy the entire world. I'll destroy all that I love. I see what happens to those waves. They hurl themselves with all their might against the immovable rocks and they disintegrate in froth and air. They lose all of their power. And yet again and again, they throw themselves at the enemy. It must be tiring. I'm tired of it. I know I must turn and face this rage to transform it. Now, I am the immovable rock, unshakable because of love, ready to meet the wave with open arms. Welcome home. I recognize that it's a feeling of emptiness and rage that's been there the whole time. But when life's going on with all of its distractions and pressures and demands, it's, it's easier to ignore it. It's easy to pretend it's not there. It's easy to, to numb out, to remain comfortable. Or at least it's an illusion of comfort. When you strip all of that away, there's nothing to do but deal with it. Nothing to do but deal with the discomfort. It's as if these things have been trapped and the spaciousness just, it just shakes it free. And for me anyway, by day three of the solo, it was like a howling wind. And I remember I got to the, the evening and I was trembling with rage. It just released. And it was profound. It was me and the full moon. Madness in a way. So I asked the moon, I asked the moon my question, why? What's the meaning of it? What's the meaning of this? And finished that night exhausted, sobbing, empty, in a sense defeated. But the answer, the answer was the next day. So that's the shift. The next day I, I woke, it was, it had rained overnight. Everything at my campsite was just, seemed shiny and glistening new. And I think I disappeared. That was a difference. This concept of Benny, the barrister, all of the things that prop that up. I just surrendered. And then I just became part of everything else. And in becoming part of everything else, the greatest peace I've ever known fell upon me. 
no labels, no requirements, no budgets. I could just be. And that's the greatest bliss and it's still with me. I've always known my favourite colour was green. I forgot why. Today, looking into the most beautiful emerald green inlet, I remember the reason. When I was a boy, my favourite thing of all was when my dad used to take me fishing. I was probably six or seven years old and he used to take me in his little, his little dinghy out into Port Phillip Bay. And I remember looking over the side of the boat down into the into the depths of the water and, and on a sunny day, it was the most brilliant green. That's the happiest I was with my dad. Most of the rest of the time, I, I think I was just afraid of him. I wish he could stay as he was when we went fishing. It occurs to me that the way I've remembered dad is maybe unfair, ironically. He was 50 when he took me on and now I'm 50. He was in some ways a troubled man. He certainly was complex, but now I understand what it is to live a complex life. And my own sons now, I think dad and I just probably struck each other at a difficult time. I wish you'd lived longer, dad. I wish we had the chance to see each other again. I like the idea of maybe being with Dad when he was 80, could have lived longer and and then I would have been 30 and maybe with a bit more life perspective, we would have maybe seen eye to eye on more things. My son, Cal, just lately has been asking me again and again whether we can go fishing. I reckon we might try that. Everything's a miracle. I found the miracle in the tiniest things. The more you look, the more you find. The tiny little wrens with all their energy bouncing around and just, you can see the joy they have in living. They appreciate, I don't know how long a wren lives. I suspect it's a very short period of time, but they extract every ounce of life out of out of that short moment they have on, on the planet. And that's the discovery. It's a miracle. We're here to extract everything we can from it. We're here to shine and love and give. And every day we get to do that is a bonus. That's the discovery. This is uh, Radio Rock. Come up here to check in with Dav. It's my last check-in. And I've come early. And it occurred to me that perspective is exactly what this time's given me. I've been able to step outside the busyness of my normal life and I've stepped out into a wild place and all of that stopped and it needed to stop to give me the opportunity to see what's real. The silence speaks the loudest. It's delivered me a lot of amazing, life-changing messages. I faced the wind and it whispered to me, What I've realized is money is the great deceiver. Money has drawn my focus away from what's important. And what's important is spending time with loved ones, with all of my heart, all of my presence. I'm not gonna count my dollars on my deathbed. I'm gonna count the precious memories, the precious moments 
So that's going to change. I'm going to count memories and not dollars. I'm going to live with an open heart. And give everything I've got from that heart to those that I love. I miss my dad. I've realised so much. I miss my mum so much. And when they're dead, they're dead forever. I'm going to use every last moment to build memories with those boys and with all my friends who I love, who I cherish. From where I started to where I finished, where I hope, where I hope I can stay, I had to, I had to deconstruct. That's what I realised that that there are these long-held patterns of thinking and believing that I just had to shine a very careful light across to ask, is this true? And I think the liberation comes when you realise, well, when you bust yourself, then you understand that these are ideas that I've probably held since I was five or six years of age. And they may have kept me safe then in some sort of survival instinct, but they're just, they're ghosts. They're irrelevant. They're not necessary anymore. And the less I label and the less I hang to those old stories, the more it opens up a field of possibilities. You study things out there, being on the coast, there's all these shells. And I just realised that I've kept myself contained. Like one of those creatures stays within the size of its shell, which may feel like you're safe or playing safe. But at the end of the day, it is the limitation. We play too small. So the leap for me is seizing back that control, living life on my terms and not playing small anymore. So my life map, my purpose is to be a guardian of love and kindness. My mission, my mission is to be a guide with my heart as my compass. My vision is a world where love and kindness bridge all differences. My legacy is to leave love and kindness in my wake. So what advice would I give my loved ones from my deathbed? No holdbacks. Who knows how long you have to live? Every second that you're here, show up, all of you. Give everything you've got to every moment that you've got. Be present. Go into nature, see the miracles that are everywhere. Let nature fill you up and come back when your cup's full. And give a drink to everyone that you love. Let them experience your spaciousness. Find your unique gift, find your purpose. It's wanting to emerge, your purpose wants to be delivered to enrich the world, find that purpose and then give it. Let that flow with everything that's in your being. Love the world and love the ones that are close to you every moment with everything you've got in your heart. I'm not sure, Darvis, if you know what difference you're making to my life and to the life of 
other men. You're literally saving men's souls. You have a beautiful soul. I love you. I love you very much, Dar, for what you've done for me. And I can't express the words that could ever thank you enough.